Thank you for being here. Welcome. If you don't mind, please fill out the poll so we know who's joining us today, what you're interested in hearing about. David, I'm going to have to make a cool background now. <laughs> I know I keep saying there's someone in your background. There's like, you know, over here. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Welcome, everyone. We will get started in just a few minutes. We want to let folks get in. It looks like most of you are here because you're an artist interested in applying, which is very exciting. And I see that Mia got in. That's great. There's a few familiar names. Hi, Beth. Some a few familiar names in the webinar. So I think we should get started so we can end on time. What do you think, Elsa? Yeah, sounds good to me. I'm gonna throw a couple of resources in the chat to get started. If you want to peruse any of those as we go along, and I will end this call and we'll be good to go. Okay, hello. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, we've got lots to cover. Uh, all about the Artists in Residence program at Recology in San Francisco. I'm going to be talking about a lot of different things. I'm going to pass it over to Deborah. Um, you're going to hear from David. So there's a lot in store. Um, my name is Elsa. I use your pronouns. I'm the supervisor of the Artists in Residence Program and Environmental Learning Center at Recology in San Francisco. Like I said, Deborah is the manager of that program. And then we have um, other amazing staff members with us, or not with us today, but on our team with us. Um, and their photos are here as well. We've got CMAPs, Micah, and Weston. Um, Weston does our writing for us. So he'll sit down with artists halfway through their residency and kind of talk about what their exhibition is going to be all about and do um, some of our writing for our promotion. So we've got a great team um, ready to support artists. And so I'm going to get more into that later on, but I'm actually going to start off just giving a quick overview of Recology, um, this kind of larger company that this program is situated in for a little bit of context. So this company is a resource recovery company. It's been operating for over a hundred years in San Francisco. It was founded by Italian immigrants who came to the US, really faced discrimination here, had a hard time finding jobs. And so they kind of created their own jobs and did what no one else really wanted to do at the time, which was basically laying the foundation for modern day recycling. They would go around in these horse-drawn carriages, collect discarded materials, and then they would sort them in the back of these wagons for reuse. So that reuse mentality is the foundation of our company, always you know, looking for alternative ways to use things that have been used before. Um, today, it looks super different though, You know, no horse-drawn carriages. We've got a more sophisticated program. We've got three bins in San Francisco, the green compost bin, blue recycling bin, and then the landfill bin. And we really have a focus on keeping our materials in the first two bins, out of the landfill bin, out of the landfill um, so that they can be reused. We can conserve our natural resources and really reduce uh, emissions. So I'm just gonna overview these three programs really quickly uh, before I jump into the artist in residence program. So to start with the green compost bin, it's all of our organic material, like food scraps, plant material, natural stuff. And we're really just working to provide the best habitat that we can for bacteria in here. That take that old stuff, um, that, you know, the organic material, they eat it, and then they produce this nutrient rich soil amendment at the end of the day, um, or at the end of about 45 days. And so we've got this nutrient rich kind of soil compost, um, and we can put it on our farms, vineyards, orchards, what have you. And it really helps all of our new plants grow because it's very nutrient rich. Um, it also holds on to water like a sponge. So farmers can produce dramatically higher yields in times of drought if they're farming with compost. 
it pulls carbon down from the atmosphere and it stores it in the soil. So it starts to kind of reverse um, the you know, emissions that we've already emitted into the atmosphere. Um, and above that, you know, just many, many more benefits of compost. So I'll stop there. Um, if you're interested in learning more, we've got a recology based webinar that goes really into detail about these things. So that link is in the chat, um, the events link. So I'm gonna transition into this other bin, our blue recycling bin. This is all recyclable material, things that we you know, use like paper, aluminum, um, you know, hard plastics, anything like that. We put in this bin all jumbled together. And so we're gonna take it to our facility called Recycle Central, where it goes through people and machines that are sorting those back into their separate commodities. We're putting all of the paper and cardboard in one pile and you know the metal in another pile. So we can send those materials out to separate companies who will take the old stuff and make new products with it. So this you know, really keeps these uh, materials in use, keeps us from pulling more resources from the earth and pretty harmful just uh, extraction practices. And it really works to uh, um, reduce emissions and create way more jobs than landfilling. So it's a great program as well. And then we've got this landfill bin basically for anything we couldn't figure out how to reuse. Um, so these are things that, you know, there's no real market for these materials or there's nothing we can really take from them um, or they just are pretty gross. So things like this, we would wanna put in the landfill bin like soft plastics and um, I won't go too into detail with that, but these materials don't get sorted. So this bin just gets dropped into this transfer station pit that top right photo there just gets a mast there and then you know, into the back of larger trucks that head out to our landfill in Vacaville, about 45 or 65 miles east of San Francisco. Um, so they don't get sorted. They just get wasted. Basically, they get buried in this hole in the ground forever. Um, and that's you know, just not really a great practice to do, right? That emits emissions and is, is not a circular economy. So again, trying to keep material out of this bin. Um, but about 80% of the things that we throw away in San Francisco do get recycled or composted. Um, but of the material that still gets placed in this bin, over half of it could have gone to a recycling or composting program. So there's still a long way to go on this. So all that being said, you know, all of that recology context information, um, we've got this really cool, unique, um, art program nestled within this company in San Francisco that's been around for 32 years. Um, and that's really working to reuse materials in a creative way and give those examples of creative reuse projects to the public, and get people really thinking about what waste is and, and again, how we can use these materials in alternative ways, really giving value back to those materials. So this is our environmental learning center. This is where our tours traditionally start um, when we're doing in-person tours, which obviously we're not doing at the moment, um, but hopefully you know, within the next year, if you're interested, you can come to our facility. Um, uh, but this is a gallery space most of the time. So this is for former work that our artists have created. We just show it kind of on a rotating basis. And then the student artist program, this is where they showcase their work at the end of their residency. The program was founded, like I mentioned, 32 years ago by a woman named Jo Hansen, who was an artist and an activist who lived in the Lower Haight. And she really drew a name for herself with this sweeping practice that she would have outside of her home and she would sweep and collect the materials that she was finding for her practice. And um, yeah, she also started this anti-litter campaign across the city and really, like I said, grew a name for herself. The city brought her out to recology. And when she saw the pile of material at the public reuse and recycling area, she was really struck that a lot of these materials could be reused by artists and were really valuable materials to artists. So together they created this program um, and, you know, over the years it stayed on about the same mission. We've really worked to inspire and educate the public about resource conservation, um, about, you know, creative reuse. Um, we also really work to support the artist community in the Bay Area, you know, this is a paid residency. Um, 
you know, we try to give as much support to the artists as possible and really working to amplify different stories and perspectives from across the community. So our artists are tasked to scavenge from the public reuse and recycling area, which is basically the dump in San Francisco. So it's not the bins. Um, I've got a few pictures I'll show what that looks like a little um, closer up. Um, but this is one artist in the in the dump kind of scavenging. So they're using as close to all of their materials as possible from this area. Um, you know, a couple details sometimes it's okay for to, you know, if they need something new, maybe we can purchase that. But the goal is to use just discarded material to create a full body of work. Um, and they got a lot of support to do that. So like I mentioned, it's a paid residency. Um, this monthly stipend is $14.50 for the professional artist program and $4.50 for the student program. Um, they get access to a large studio space, which then converts to an exhibition venue. You get administrative support, help installing and hanging their work promoting the exhibition, and then access to a full range of tools as well. We accept artists from all different disciplines. So we've got a pretty stocked shop um, with all different types of tools that they may need, you know, electric, you know, saws, hand tools, what have you, um, a glass kiln, you know, there's all sorts of things, sewing machine. Um, if you've got questions about what we've got available, if you need something specific for our project you have in mind, feel free to type those in the Q&A. Um, if you've got any other questions as well, feel free to type those in the Q&A. But we try to give as much support, like I mentioned to our artists as possible. And this is the public reuse and recycling area. So this is where our artists are pulling their materials from. Um, the public, you know, anyone can come with their car or their, their vehicle, they can unload whatever materials they're finished with. And the artists are just one aspect of recycling that happens in this building. We, we go through all this material as well. You know, we pull off materials to donate or for specialized recycling programs, we sort this material as well. So I'll just mention that. So these are more like experiential photos of, you know, we can't be there in person, but uh, it's a dusty environment, it's dirty, you know, this is trash, um, things that people are throwing away. So, you know, that's just a thing to be prepared for if you're interested in this residency. Um, we've got pretty in-depth training um, for safety. Um, and, you know, our artists have to wear a lot of safety gear as well. So, um, yeah, we, we do our best um, to prepare our artists for all of this, but that is just, you know, something to keep in mind if it's for you. So at the end of this residency, we've got two artists working at a time for the professional program. They work for four months. So that's six artists are selected per year for the year of residencies. Um, so after they spend the four months scavenging, creating their work, we put on a three-day exhibition where we showcase that work to the public. So anyone can come by and usually a few hundred people come by each day to see the work. Um, we've got a Friday opening, a Saturday, and then Tuesday evening, we do an artist talk. So artists will spend maybe 10 minutes, um, 15 minutes talking to the public, answering questions um, about the work. But they're very fun. And then after the residency is over, our artists leave behind between one and three pieces of art, and we add that to our permanent collection, which we showcase across the city, across the US. Um, and yeah, so our artists continue to get a lot of exposure um, and their work continues to be shown decades after the residency is over. Um, we're still showing work from, you know, when the, the program began from our very first artist. So this is one of our offsite exhibitions, the largest one that we did at the SFO Museum in 2013. Um, you know, millions of people saw this work. It was a hundred pieces from a, a lot of our different artists. Um, and over 200 have, have participated in the program. So we're gonna SF camera work, which was fun. And then um, a recent exhibition at the Bedford Gallery in Walnut Creek. Um, we're going to be doing a traveling exhibition with them coming up across the US. So we're excited about that. And then one other aspect of the residency that I'll just touch on 
before I pass it over to Deborah, is that I also mentioned that we've got this educational tour program that's you know combined in our um, our field and, and what we do here. So um, people who are interested in art, people who are interested in sustainability or how um, their products, you know, a business that's interested in how their product filters through uh, the recycling system. We've got all different types of people um, starting at the third grade age up through, you know, all ages of adults who are coming through this facility and they all walk through the artist studio. And so we require that at least one of the two artists is present for each tour. Um, and so they'll talk to this full range of, of people about their work, um, usually get some insight from the kids on what they're doing and what they should do. Um, and it's, you know, it's a lot of people to talk to and that can seem intimidating to some artists. Um, but most people tell us how thankful they are for that opportunity at the end of their residency to get that feedback throughout their process and to really put into words, um, yeah, their conceptual intent for their works as well. So um, it can be a big help to artists. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Deborah to talk about some of our former artists who have gone through the program. Great. Thanks, Elsa, for that great introduction. Thank you, David, for joining us. And um, thanks to everyone who's here and who's interested in applying. Um, so Elsa mentioned this, but we've worked with over 200 artists since the inception of the program in 1990. And that's mostly Ben Bay Area artists. We have had a curator from Russia and we've had three artists from Haiti, but mostly, mostly the artists are from the Bay Area. We want to support the local artists. Um, these are some snapshots of the work that's been created, and it's surprising because the work is so varied, and artists are pulling pretty much from the same pile of materials. Like the materials don't really change. Like you might find a few treasures that are different from an, what another artist finds, but it's really pretty much the same. And we've had artists who work in um, sculpture, of course, and mixed media, uh, photography, video, sound, new media. I said performance, uh, cartoons. We've had an artist whose emphasis is on research. So really runs the gamut. And this is the first time in two and a half years that we've accepted applications. So we're really excited about that. Next slide. The deadline is September 1st. So I, I see that a lot of folks have started the application um, and we have a few that have been submitted. So just make sure you hit the submit button by September 1st. And we're asking you to send six images of your strongest work. Don't send us six images of work where uh, you're using recycled materials or found materials because you think that that's what we want. It's not. We want to see your strongest work. We're not a uh, found art program, even though artists use found art, uh, found materials. We're not a junk art program. The artists who are who have been in the residency are um, are different levels. They're emerging mid-career and professional, but they may have never worked with found materials and it may not be part of their practice. It's just like the foundation of, of what of what we do, but there's a it's a lot broader than that. So we usually receive about 100 to 150 applications. I think we're gonna probably top out at 150. There's a lot in there right now because we've been closed for so long. And then in October, we'll meet with the advisory board and the advisory board and I will choose eight finalists. And then from that eight, we'll choose six for the year. So two at a time for four months and they're scheduled out pretty much right away. So we'll sign the contracts and get everybody's schedules set. And we'll even have the um, exhibition date set. Um, let's see what else. Um, next slide. Okay, here's some other things to talk about. So again, no past work with found materials or environmental um, messaging is necessary. I also talked about speaking to tour groups, 95% of what artists use has to be found on site. And, and this is for artists who can spend 20 hours a week during the work week here on site. So if you have a nine to five job, Monday through Friday, this, this residency will not work for you. You have to be here at least a little bit during the week to meet the tour groups and kind of check in with us. And then we ask artists to create a, a body of work for the final exhibition. There are a few limitations on the work that can be created, um, nothing controversial and the same kind of uh, ideas like the Arts Commission. So 
no violence, no sexual content, no weapons, no offensive remarks about certain individuals or specific businesses. And then we have limitations on political commentary. So you couldn't attack a politician. Um, no matter how much we are all in agreement, it's just, um, we just don't allow that. And then, um, and it's not like, and it's always a constant ongoing conversation um, in the same way that when we choose the three pieces for the permanent collection, we're actually two or three pieces. We won't go in there and say, we want these three pieces. It's a conversation. So we want something that it, that we can show that it will be easy to show in, in like un, um, unusual spaces. So sometimes we'll show we're at the airport and we'll show it in a downtown office building. Um, and they don't not usually set up like a gallery. So we want work that we can hang and that we two people could carry. And um, yeah, again, it's a conversation. So we won't take your favorite piece. It, it's we've never had a problem with it in the 20 something years I've been here. Next slide. This is a few of our artists scavenging. So artists take go get materials with the shopping cart and then we weigh the shopping carts because we want to see how many how much we're diverting from the landfill. Next slide. And then, you know, real big shout out to our advisory board, many of whom have been on the advisory board for many, many years. They're super dedicated um, and have, and, and really spent a lot of time like sending people our way and then thinking about, um, thinking about how to choose artists, how to choose a diverse group of artists in all regards. So a really wonderful group of folks. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some of the artists and it's always difficult to choose who, but on Tuesday we had another webinar. So it's on our YouTube channel, it's Recology AIR YouTube, where we talk about different artists. So I'm just gonna be very brief. If you wanna find out more, you can go to our website. Hopefully it's, it's kind of off right now, the artist section disappeared, but they're working on that. But you can go to their individual pages and then there are um, summaries in the press release section because often the work is much more complex and interesting than what I can talk about here. Okay, so Estelle was one of the early artists. Um, she's still a working artist and she created a line of clothing um, out of materials like six pack holders and blinds and our employees and folks from the SF environment wore these garments to the black and white ball, which is this fundraising event in San Francisco and the money goes back to San Francisco Symphony. But it was a really great, wonderful way to show at the beginning of this program, like how important it is to reuse materials for something like really lovely, like a line of clothing. Next, I think we're gonna jump a few years is Sudu and Sudu works with planned obsolescence. So he found all of this, um, these electronics from the seventies that still were. If you buy electronics now, they have a little chip in there and it's like planned to obsolesce or plan to break down and you can't replace it or fix it you have to go buy a new one which is you know great for the company but not great for the environment so he had all this old 70s equipment that he was working with for his project next is bill photographer and he photographed decaying fruits and vegetables so there's this very landscape quality to it but it's really just mold on um, an avocado and he also built this structure of compost that you could climb into and shut the door and you could get like the smell and the sense of compost um, while you're at an art show. So it's really great experimentation on his part. Terry is on our advisory board. Um, she's a kinetic artist. Um, she just, in the next image, you'll see, I think, I hope uh, a piano that she dismantled and she reassembled it and her friend worked on the electronics in the middle that you see and it was meant so that multiple people could play it at the same time. She also filled the shopping cart with concrete. This is commenting on the economical, environmental, and um, societal weight of our overconsumption. Next is Julia. So Julia interviewed one of our um, retired employees and she, um, Found, she started talking to him and she found out that women used to sort rags at this site where I am right now, where the artist program is, they would sort rags in this warehouse until 1965. So they were, and, and at the time, like there wasn't a lot of polyester. It was just kind of coming on the, in the clothing world, but um, so it was mostly like cotton and wool. And it was a really difficult job, right? Like dusty and dirty. 
And she wanted to pay homage to the work that they did. So she collected old cotton sheets and she pulped it and made paper out of it and then found out their names and um, found old um, opera sheets. And she found this in like pre-1965 font that she used. And then she carved in to get the relief. And then she made the, I think I have one more image, I hope to make these pieces and they're honoring these these particular women who have long since died but some of their relatives still work for recology so this is Rita Bianchi which is a very common name at recology Emma Muzio so a really lovely project honoring work done by women Yulia um oh, I jumped there for a minute so Yulia uh I think this is not supposed to be here, but it's Yulia Pinkusevich. Let's go back for a minute since you saw the slide. The first one's missing, but she, this is like, these are the internal parts of computers and TVs. And so she, she built this little diorama and then she projected it onto the wall. So it's got this like cityscape sense to it. She's very interested in architecture. Um, yeah, so sorry about that. Kara is a painter. And um, all of the paint that painters use has to be found here. And it is incredible how much paint gets thrown away. It's unbelievable. So we think like somebody decides that they want to be a painter. So they buy all the acrylic paints, the artist paints, and then the, it doesn't work out. So then they throw them away. And or artists can use house paint. When she was here, she um, became interested in the animals that live on site. So she started incorporating these very detailed draw up. Uh, drawings and then paintings of the animals, juxtaposed to this like vibrant, explosive um, backgrounds. Next slide is Jenny. Okay, so Jenny um, works with, well, she worked with augmented reality, but she was here, she's a research artist. And so she found 200 objects that, and um, she started to do a deep dive about each object. And she developed this Bureau of Suspended Objects, which was this like bureaucratic, office government agency, and she was the chief archivist. Um, she's also the author of oh, How to Do Nothing, um, I think Resisting uh, the Attention Economy, which was like on the New York Times bestseller list. But anyway, so she did a deep dive in each of these objects and she found out like the Google Street where the where the menu, where the um, warehouse was. She like got videos of like 1970s commercials for products. She had other anecdotal information like the stories about the founders. And then she added these in the next image, these scannable QR codes that you could come and you could look and find out more information. And then she uh, had a book. I don't think I have that, but she's like this 800 page book that accompanied the whole. So she's showing that like these, even these like cheap disposable items that we pay $4 for have a real complex history and they require an enormous amount of resources to produce. Next is Mike Arcega, also on our board. And he uh, termed the, well, he didn't term it, but he used, he employed the term Nasarima, which is American spelled backwards. And it was coined by an anthropologist from the 50s that kind of satir satirized um, the study of world cultures and that kind of emphasized like otherness. Um, that was used by generations of anthropologists. Um, anyway, um, Mike, he approaches like the North Americans as a strange people whose like um, rituals can be studied through their garbage. So in the next image, you'll see, this is like, it was during the, I think it was during the holidays. I can't remember what year does it say? Anyway, he, um, this was a blow up Santa Claus and then he had this animal, um, installation and then another cactus. So really interesting work, thoughtful work. Next is Ma Li. She created, she worked, her work was based off this fairy tale, this Chinese fairy tale about two star-crossed lovers. And she cut open 2,000 water bottles and hung them from the ceiling. So this is really magical space. We had a performance in the evening on a Tuesday evening and then Wednesday morning, we moved the performance to the Asian Art Museum. So we do collaborate with a lot of local organizations. Next is Chris Sollers. He um, created five films, five videos where he was the protagonist in each of the films, like kind of coming from another planet perhaps, kind of science fiction-y. Next is Ramakan worked uh, when he, when he was here, he had just kind of quit his full-time job and he started working with shards. And it was a, 
and he was thinking about the election at the time and like how there's um, like the shards have these rough edges. And so he sanded many of the shards and at the opening he gave them away. Well, now his current work is all about shards and his other practice, which is a um, crochet jam. So he's he's got this beautiful work that's mixing fabric and shards together for these lovely sculptures. Next is um, Amanda and Jennifer. They're very interested in compost. So they did a lot of research on compost. And in the next slide, you'll see they took and plastics and so they took plastic and used paint and you'll see the markings are from plastic um, like single use plastic containers. Next is I thought I took a lot out it seems like there's so many artists in here I'm going to keep going so Mark Basasaki uh, looked at our relationship to the landscape and how it's tied to memory and experience. Next is Alicia Escott. She's uh, her work is informed by scientific uh, study, and she was influenced by the uh, mountains, the San Bruno Mountains that are right across the street. Um, and so the animals that she focused on populate the region nearby. Next slide. So here, next slide. Genevieve, in, her installation included like audio, video, and other interactive components. She's self-taught, um, but they reference global manufacturing technology and, com and communication. Next slide. So she sewed these elaborate costumes for characters that incorporate speakers and other devices. Next slide. Victor works with um, labor, issues around labor. Next slide. And these are, these are actually the, the handles of tools that um, he found in the PRRA. Okay, great. Oh, and Keisha. So she uses photography uh, to explore ideas of like heritage and home, inheritance. I think I have one more. These are brooms again. A lot of brooms come through, a lot of issues around labor, a lot of projects around labor. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce David, one of our current artists. He's a cross-disciplinary artist whose practice centers around experimental filmmaking with a focus on converging relationships between spirituality, technology, and crisis. He received his MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. So sad about San Francisco Art Institute. But in 2010, he's exhibited work in the Bay Area at Bass and Rayner at all. Um, San Francisco Art Institute Commissions, Southern Exposure, Yerba Center for the Arts, and more. And his work has been shown in Los Angeles, Vancouver, and Mexico City. And editions of his work can be found in, in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the Whitney. With that, I will hand it over to you, David. Oh, you have 10 to 12 minutes. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> thank you, Deborah. Uh, thank you all so much for having me. Um, it's uh, great to, to be here uh, mid-progress in my residency. So I thought I would today just sort of uh, quickly talk about my last project before coming to Recology and then sort of giving a behind the scenes sort of look at where I'm at in my process uh, this summer during my residency at Recology. Um, so uh, to start, uh, the slide that you see here is uh, a film poster in a slide, uh, a screenshot from my last film called The Varian Project. Um, this was a film that was done during, I guess what you could call the, the COVID residency. Um, so uh, it was made over the course of about nine months while we were all in lockdown. Um, my work is very much interested, uh, interested in uh, crisis, but more specifically the shapes and of, of how people, society, structures, nature, organisms all react to crisis. So not necessarily crisis itself, but the sort of shape of how things react to those crises. So um, this was sort of a psychological uh, 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 look at, at how uh, the daily commute of urban life changes uh, because of something like a, a global pandemic. So uh, next slide. Uh, this is a shot from the installation of uh, the film, which was shown at Telematic Media Arts uh, in Soma in uh, September of last year. Um, and next slide. 
And if you press play, this is a very uh, quick sort of scrub through of every scene from the film. Uh, yeah, I think if we press play, it should just kind of quickly flash it, through through all it, the. Should I have the volume on? Uh, no, no, not for this. So yeah, um, during the uh, you know the course of of lockdown, uh, a lot of folks, including myself, still had to sort of participate in the the urban routine of commute and while at the same time dealing with their own sort of uh, psychological neuroses of, of dealing with this crisis that is now reshaping urban life. So um, I, I took this as a unique opportunity to uh, investigate the sort of cinematic tropes that have to deal with like um, what are called Fisher Kingdoms, which is a cinematic trope where uh, if a character is experiencing a certain emotional state, that emotional state is reflected in uh, the in the cinematic landscape of the environment which they inhabit. A really good example of this is when um, like a villain, a Disney villain, like Scar from The Lion King, like takes over and the landscape becomes like gloomy and dark. Um, and also, I've always just wanted to uh, experiment with like horror movie tropes. So um, I was able to during lockdown make this over the over nine months and uh, show it last last uh, September. And next slide. And yeah, along with that, I was able to uh, do a few ink drawings for the film as well, which you can see here. And um, if anyone's interested, what I'll do is in the chat um make sure that's set to everyone i'll post uh the vimeo link to the film uh with the viewing password so i'll just put that in the chat right now it's about a 14 minute short film and the i'll put in the password right now and there's the password so if anyone after the talk would like to go and check out the film uh feel free to just go ahead and, and give it a view um, okay, so uh, let's uh, kind of switch gears and we can talk more about where I'm at in my uh, experience mid-residency. So um, next slide, please. So um, an interesting challenge I, I found with Recology is that, um, you know, you know, you don't know what you're going to find. There's a lot of sort of serendipitous moments that are going to occur uh, when, when, you're, when you're starting to scavenge. Um, an interesting challenge too was was that uh, I, we had a two year hiatus between when uh, I, I, I was first given the residency and when it started. So um, it was an inter it was interesting to get in there and wonder what was going to happen. So my goal was to uh, at the very start just to start sourcing um, objects that I was just formally interested in uh, their, their shapes, their, their sizes. And, and what I was planning to do was start to do, um, 3d, uh, scans photogrammetry where I take lots of different photographs of the found objects from different angles, source those into 3d models, and then develop a new, uh, video work and sculpture work based off of, uh, those forms and then sort of let the ideas sort of percolate from there. Um, so, uh, these are two of the first objects that I had, I had found. Um, next slide, please. And on the uh, right here, you can see a, a finished uh, model source from a 3D scan and then sort of finished in a 3D software uh, called Blender. And um, then starting to think about, okay, well, we now have these situated as virtual objects. How does that relationship change into any sort of potential video narratives or any sort of sculpture work. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so it's sort of strange. Uh, early on, you sort of have to start quickly making decisions because um, the residency seems really long until it starts and then all of a sudden deadlines can start seeming like they're going to creep up on you. So you have to start making decisions fast. So I was very much uh, enamored with just the form of this shape. Um, I did research and it is a uh, 16 millimeter uh, spool reel for a vintage 16 millimeter editing base, which I thought was really interesting, uh, having this connection back to moving image. Um, so I took, again, uh, a 3D scan and then cleaned up the model and um, started to evolve the form. Um, so next slide. You can start to see here 
uh, the evolution from the original uh, documentation, 3D scan of the model, the cleanup and remodeling of the object, and then over the course of a few weeks, really starting to play with the shape of it, having this sort of dual idea of thinking about both the intention of the tool from a utilitarian perspective, the fact that it's supposed to be spinning this this uh, film reel, uh, but then also a little bit of like pareidolia where you're just sort of looking at it and thinking about all the other possible things that it could look like. So I was starting to sort of find, as you're playing with the sculpture in 3D space, you start sort of finding other sort of narrative connections to the shapes that might not otherwise exist when you look at it um, in, in real life. Um, so the image that you see on the right is the final design for uh, the one of the, the sculpture work that's going to be a part of my residency. Um, and then there down on the bottom left, you can see the original object. The objects that I've found so far have been pretty small. Um, I was hoping I was going to find some larger things, but so far I've been everything's relatively uh, on the small side. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, just to give a different view um, of the design of the sculpture so uh, uh, that I'm currently in progress making, um, just the kind of left front and back, back view. Uh, next slide. Um, so in my practice, uh, I do have a sculptural practice that runs in tandem to my, to my filmmaking and, and painting and drawing practice. Um, I 3D print uh, my sculptures once I've made them, uh, designed them in the computer. Um, this is using what's called an FDM printer, which prints, uh, which basically creates uh, 3D shapes extruding a uh, plastic material, which is actually a, a recycled plastic through a hot end and then it prints out the shape over the course depending on the size um, over the course of a few days. Um, so I'm currently in the process of uh, building these out and putting the pieces together um, and that's that's always had a kind of a labor of love process and you're just kind of hoping nothing breaks and things like that but you can start to see here on the left and then flowing to the right how uh, the shapes are starting to come together. Next slide. Um, this is just a quick uh, studio shot. I've been having to jump in between both my Recology uh, space and my studio, which is luckily in the mission not too far just because my, my 3D printing equipment is there. Um, but you can see here sort of a build, build out of the rest of the shapes. And then in my own process, what I do after uh, I'm done finishing 3D uh, the 3D uh, scaffolding. Um, I apply layers of an epoxy clay uh, that gives it an overall finish that looks a lot more akin to um, a porcelain sort of sort of surface. Um, and then you can see here on the bottom right, sometimes uh, the prints can take a pretty long time, like 59 hours, sometimes on the bad, on the bad end of things. So I, I sometimes set up a baby monitor so I can watch them from, from home. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, these are just sort of the, uh, you know, the, the sort of logistics of, uh, of what I'm doing with the sculpture. And then I'm going to be sourcing some concrete for the base. Cause you can see here the, it's very, um, the design of it is very, uh, lopsided. And so I have to, I'm going to have to be sourcing a counterbalance, uh, for the sculpture for its, for its final installation. Next slide, please. Um, so in tandem with the, uh, sculpture piece, I am also working on a, uh, new, uh, video work for, uh, for the residency. Um, I'll go into greater detail with this, uh, but this is a sort of test still, uh, for, for the, for the film that I'm going to be, for the video that I'm going to be working on. Next slide, please. Um, so to give a little quick backstory on where my thinking is in terms of the sort of concepts behind the video, uh, I'll quickly describe these two images. Um, on the left is, uh, coastal Oregon where my family lives. Uh, this is in a place called Otter Rock, which is a marine reserve. It's the smallest marine reserve in the U.S. And um, it's a really, truly incredible location. Um, but more often than not these days, uh, especially after a good storm, um, you can see here on the right that there is just this continuous unending uh layers of plastics that are just being added to the coastline um, over and over again from uh, mostly from the garbage patch out in the Pacific. But um, 
I was, uh, bef- right before I started the residency, I would come up and I was uh, always wanting to do a piece where I use the environment of the, of the coast there because uh, it's so beautiful to do something and having all the, the connection going on between dealing with, you know, ideas of the waste stream and then also seeing this in that environment kind of connected those two ideas for me. So next slide. Um, again, uh, you can press play on uh, uh, one of these videos if you want. It's, yeah, on any, on the two on the left there. But basically uh, what I did was I took some cell phone video um, and I was, uh, at the time I wish I had had a tripod. I wasn't really thinking about it, but um, the coast there is, like I said, really beautiful and has this primordial um, early early ocean sort of aesthetic to me that I always love from like early illustrations. So um, I was able to isolate and stabilize the video and loop it and then recolor it to more reference those sort of illustrations. And next slide. And then uh, basically my idea was um, sort of just playing out this idea of just like an ocean or an ecosystem coastline that is being continually saturated with plastics. And I sort of like to play with sort of like absurdist ideas. So, so I had the idea of like, well, what if, you know, if a coastline or an ecosystem uh, on a planet becomes so saturated with, with plastics that over a long enough timeline, uh, those, those uh, hydrocarbons and plastics and chemicals uh, can mix together again to form some sort of abiogenesis, which is just like where the chemicals come together to form new life forms. So I'm sort of imagining this like absurdist sort of coastline where the plastics and refuse and, the, and all these different shapes and particles all come together to sort of form a new ecosystem. Um, so next slide. So in the sort of vein of like this primordial soup of life emerging from the ocean, I'm sort of uh, reimagining that uh, space, but with um, these these sort of overly designed objects that come from the refuse stream and these different sort of plastic shapes, all of which I'm going to be 3D continuing to 3D scan from objects sourced from uh, scavenging at Recology and then creating a... Uh, sort of um nature documentary scene of this coastal tide pool um you can press play on on uh this video too and then the challenge of of that was trying to recreate um a sense of the ocean as it's uh crashing into these different rocks and things like that so i've been sort of uh learning how to start more accurately doing some like fluid simulations and next slide please and um trying to get a sense of like these floating particulates in the water um and you can you can jump to the next slide after that and uh this is sort of a quick if you press play on this you can kind of see what the simulation looks like without the without all the the rendering and stuff going on so um yeah so that is uh more or less where i'm at in my in my uh progress at the residency it's been a really um you know, like I said, my work work deals with uh, crisis as sort of a catalytic, uh, a, or excuse me, a catalyst for different actions, societal actions, environmental actions, like how the shapes of what those things can take because of crisis. So um, it really is kind of an overwhelming experience when you go to start scavenge and you, you know, you see it in person, just the amount of, you know, what it, what it is to really see the waste stream. Um, and it's been, yeah, a really, it's been a really interesting experience so far. And I think, um, we may have one more slide. I'm not sure. Yeah. And then this is a sort of hopeful fingers crossed mock-up test of what my, I'm hoping the installation will look like. Um, and yeah, I think that's the last slide, but, uh, thank you all for, uh, letting me present and, uh, uh hopefully I'll be able to talk more about this work in the coming months. So exciting. I'm really excited to see what it looks like in the end. And you know, when you started, you had a completely different project. You were gonna finish the other film you were working on. And I think this project is more relevant to Recology because we talk about plastics all the time, single use plastics. So I yeah. love it. I think it's gonna be great. Great. <laughs> so we'll open it up for Q&A after I'm almost done. And then, so stick. can you stick around for a few more minutes? Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. Okay, we also have a student program for 
university and colleges in the Bay Area. Artists uh, work out of a shipping container, so you can see the inside of it here. The um, if you know an, a student artist, if you have a student in one of your classes, let us know or send them our way. It's um, art at recology.com. They don't go through the formal application process. Next slide. So Christina was also an SFAI student and she uh, used the word enajanciones, which described the materials that she found. And it can be translated, um, she said as alienation or disposals. Um, and which can reference both people and the objects that she created. Next is Layla was uh, out of UC Berkeley and she was all, she was here during the pandemic. So, um, she, and she had to wait, but she designed a line of clothing or uh, garments that reflected the times or during the mass protests. And so she, her intention was that they would have multiple uses. So you could have like water embedded in the garments or you, they, um, the face, the face, the coverings would um, diffuse facial recognition software. <clears throat> and then the next slide you'll see, um, we had a fashion show in the PRRA by some models, some friends of hers. Uh, and we often commission artists after they leave to do special projects. So this was Saran and he designed a mural. He has a lot of murals in the mission. If you live in San Francisco, you, you're probably familiar with his work. They often have a societal message and the message here is like directed to kids. Uh, and this truck is uh, driving around every day around the city. Next, during uh, lockdown, during COVID, we came up with, a uh, you know, like everyone, we had to transition to the um, virtual world. And so we have a bunch of um, workshops on our, uh, YouTube channel. We also have a pretty active um, social media uh, account. So it's Recology AIR. Next slide. Um, we had a we have a series of panels um, from former artists also on our website, on our YouTube channel. And then I think we're almost done. We have two more slides. So we all at Recology has three other programs in Seattle, Portland, and Astoria. And um, the one in Seattle is just a recology program, but uh, Glean in Portland and the one in Astoria are collaborations with other entities and organizations. And we just celebrated 10 years for the Glean program in Portland. Next. So I'd like to end with this image of our founder who I had the privilege of knowing. Um, she was on our advisory board um, an, um, almost until she died. And she was such an influential force. Uh, she had this idea and um, it has influenced so many of us and certainly affected my life and the life of many artists. So I just wanna give a shout out to Jo um, and the work that she did. Okay, so we do have like six minutes, seven minutes left. If there are any questions for David or questions for us, Okay, there is a question by Emily. It says, thank you for this presentation. I'm wondering how important it is that the material, material used in the residency project end up physically in the final work. So it, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to end up in the final work. So like Keisha Lucas was a photographer. We have multiple photographers. David um, is, not, is probably gonna have one piece in the, in the final work. We've had other filmmakers. Um, that have not used anything in the final piece, but the, like, I'm thinking specifically of Kate Rhodes, who did a 26 minute film based on Jim Lab, uh, Jim Henson's um, film Labyrinth. She created these puppets. The puppets were not shown. She didn't want to show them at the opening, but they are in the, in the video. And then we kept the puppets to show after her residency was over. Oh, another great question from Emily. So how important is it to stick to your proposal? That's a really good question. So in your proposal, do not say, I am gonna let the materials that I find dictate my project. We, we don't wanna hear that because we often will, the proposal definitely affects like our scoring. So we wanna hear new, and exciting proposals, you don't have to stick to it because you might get here and you're like, oh, I can't do it. Like with David, like he already finished his film, so he's not going to work out, continue to work on that film or you don't find the materials that you need. But we want to hear an exciting and um, original, perhaps, uh, proposal. 
Okay, here's one. Thank you for, is there a place? Yes. Oh no, we don't have previous artist proposals online, but if you go to our website and if you'll just have to type in Recology Air Artist and you'll find the link right now, I, like I mentioned earlier, the link isn't live from our website. You can go in and you can look at their final projects. So if you, re, if you go into each individual artist and you click on press release, you'll see their proposals there, not proposals, but their final project. Jewelry in the found material, is there any jewelry? We art, People throw away jewelry all the time, it's crazy. Yeah, you can put jewelry in there. Uh, do you consider collaborative applications? We do. If you are a collaboration, the stipend is split and you, and you when you fill out the application, fill it out, uh, I, for, email me at art at recology.com so I can explain it. But basically you have two applications, one proposal, you have to let us know if you'd be considered separately or just as a collaborative team, um, yeah. Is there a lot of organic matter or discarded landscaping materials? Yes, there are. There's a lot of discarded landscaping, a huge pile of it. Um, clay, we've had two ceramicists um, and, it, uh, and they didn't find any clay. We have a kiln, it's not really set up. It's only set up for glass, um, but uh, you could use it, but there's not no clay. But they, so it's Kathy Lou, and I spoke about her work on Tuesday and Eric Skolin. And so they worked, they, they worked with different materials. It was kind of interesting. Kathy used um, cable and she coiled it in the same way you might coil um, clay. But she, she made these vases that were, you know, they looked like if you look from far away, they could be, they could be maybe clay, but the same kind of shape. And then Eric's project, I'm running out of time, but Eric's project was so so interesting, he, he worked with VHS tape and he created this immersive installation where you walk through all of this um, uh, um, VHS tape. And it just reminded me, I forgot to talk about, we have very strict limitations on using photographs that are post 1930, because we wanna protect our customers, um, their identity. So you can, you, if you use post 1930 video or photographs, you have to obscure it somehow. And Eric did that. He found all these old home videos and he just scraped it all off. And he had this jar of scrapings from films that was like dedicated to this couple. It was all of their anniversary photographs. It was a really beautiful way to kind of celebrate that. Okay, sorry. Is it possible to collaborate with the facility laborers? Probably not usually, they're really busy. Um, their union employees. Uh, it depends on what the collaboration might be. I mean, anything's possible, but um, please contact me um, if you have something very specific in mind and I can kind of walk you through it. Beth asked, if one is accepted, does one have to accept the given time period or is there some flexibility? No, what I do is once we choose the artist, well, we ask you what your, what your favorite time period is and we say, first choice, second choice, third choice. And then I spend all this time trying to work it all out. And then I'll email you and say, is this gonna work? So I, we've never had to give anybody their third choice. Um, so far it's all worked out. So no, we would never force you to do a time period that wouldn't work, that wouldn't work for you. Do we see a lot of CRT televisions, the old school televisions? Yes, and there are some limitations on how you can handle those. We don't see a lot anymore, we used to. Are you allowed any physical help in the accumulation of materials? It depends. Um, we're working with Creativity Explored. It's an um, a organization in San Francisco. And a lot of the folks, the artists there can't scavenge for many reasons. So they have teaching artists that are gonna scavenge for them, but that's provided through their organization. So if um, somebody needed, um, needed help, we don't have anybody anymore who could do that, but we could con definitely consider figuring something out. It wouldn't be all the time. It would be some of the time, possibly. But yes, we wanna make sure that we accommodate anyone who wants to be in residence. Okay, David, any questions for David? Oh, I know what, opening. When is your opening date, the opening? uh october 14th 15th uh, the weekend of october 14th and 15th and the 18th for the and, artist talk and the 18th for the artist talk that's right 
And then I imagine the video or parts of it will be live. We'll have we'll have a link to it from our website or something. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, cool. All right, it's 1.30. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Again, my email is art at recology.com for those of you who had questions I couldn't answer right now. So thanks again, David, for joining us. This will be on our YouTube channel if you missed anything. Thank you for All having right. me.